This is Books, Beats, and Beyond, where we will bring you provocative music and engaging interviews from music artists, authors, and others with topics that will pique your curiosity. I'll be your host, Taj. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Paul C. Taylor about his book titled Black is Beautiful, A Philosophy of Black Aesthetics. Throughout black history and culture, aesthetics has long been a central concern for black thinkers and activists. And yet this important subject has been almost entirely neglected by philosophical aesthetics and the philosophy of art. Black is Beautiful provides a long overdue synthesis, identifying and exploring the most significant philosophical issues that emerge from the aesthetics dimension of black life, both in the fine arts and beyond. Dr. Paul C. Taylor teaches philosophy and African-American studies at Pennsylvania State University, where he also served as head of the Department of African-American Studies. He has also provided commentary on race and politics for newspapers and radio shows globally. Dr. Paul C. Taylor, welcome to Books, Beats, and Beyond. Thanks very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you. This book is a very interesting book. I was just wondering what motivated you? Why did you take this on? Well, uh, you've done a pretty good job of explaining the motivation in your uh, very helpful introduction. Um, I'm trained as a philosopher. And one of the reasons I went into philosophy was to explore some of the issues that, as you rightly note, Uh, Black artists, black critics, black curators, uh, black culture workers of a variety of kinds have taken up for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Uh, But once I started down that road, I realized that uh, philosophy as a discipline, uh, that is to say professional philosophy, the kind of philosophy that gets practiced by people with PhDs and who are employed by colleges and universities, uh, that enterprise had very little interest in the things that drew me to philosophy. Mm. Um, I thought of philosophy as a vocation more than as a profession, which Mm. is not uncommon. People who are just learning about it uh, don't make that distinction, uh, nor should they. Mm. Uh, The vocation of philosophy is what people do whenever they try to answer deep, hard questions in certain kinds of ways. The profession is what happens when people get credentialed and legitimated and employed in certain ways. And the vocation rightly encourages people to ask hard questions about things like, you know, the uh, the way invisibility has become a theme in black expressive culture. Mm-hmm. But the profession has very, as you noted, had very little interest in that for straightforward reasons we can talk about that begin with the uh, demographic asymmetries in the profession. It's an overwhelmingly white discipline, uh, one of the whitest humanities disciplines. What would you say the percentage is? What would you say? Sorry. Intervene there. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, what do you think the percentage of black philosophers are in in the uh, community? Well, um, I could have told you with some precision as of a couple of years ago. I haven't paid attention as closely uh, Mm -hmm. since then because it was profoundly discouraging. But Mm -hmm. as of a couple of years ago, uh, the membership in the American Philosophical Association, which is the main professional organization for philosophers in the U.S. um, and to some degree in Canada, but Canada has its own philosophical organization. Mm -hmm. Um, That organization had just shy of 11,000 members. Mm. Uh, Again, as of a couple of years ago, fewer than 200 of those people were black. Oh, wow. And fewer fewer than 30 of them were black women. Mm. But you said you you kind of see a little increase, (laughs) just a little bit, huh? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Do you what do you think is attributing to that? Do you know? Oh, well, uh, there are some pretty straightforward uh, hypotheses that we'd have to appeal to our friends in the social sciences to confirm and disconfirm. But um, I, I learned to think about these things in this way from people like one of my mentors, Lou Outlaw. Uh, who's also now my colleague at Vanderbilt. I've moved to Vanderbilt recently, oh, okay. so I'm no longer at Penn State. Um, but there, there are a couple of simple things to point to. One is just the history of segregation in American higher education, right? Mm-hmm, so right. until very recently, um, it was not uncommon to not have black faculty at very many predominantly white institutions, and that those were the institutions that had the resources and the, the sort of cultural and institutional space Mm-hmm. to build thriving humanities departments. Um, 
that reading of it is a little um, ahistorical. I, I'm being a little crude about it just for the sake of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the stories to tell, of course, is that you know this is part of the uh, int- one of the interesting features of the history of HBCUs in the U.S. Those were the places where Black folks did, went to do this kind of work, and right. so there's a there's a a long and interesting history of humanities scholarship and and public scholarship in pl- at places like Howard and Fisk and Spelman mm, and Morehouse, okay. of course, right? Yeah. Uh, but that work was segregated not just in terms of occupational roles, but also in terms of publication. Mm-hmm. And so when people are trained now to read philosophy to the extent that they do any historical work, they read the main journals, which is not where Elaine Locke was publishing. Mm-hmm. It's not where Du Bois was publishing, right? Right. Um, so to learn your way around the profession has until very recently been to learn your way around a space that's populated almost entirely by white people. Mm, And for people like me who wanted, nevertheless, for whatever reason to make their way into this space, it's discouraging, right? You look and say, maybe this isn't the space for me. Mm -hmm. And so then just to very briefly uh, wrap up this caricature of a story, um, so then once you're in, you look around and you see, as I did with respect to aesthetics, that the people who are here aren't asking the questions you want to ask. Right. And then on top of that, you find what um, a wonderful philosopher, Anita Allen Castellito at, at Penn, has, has said very eloquently. Uh, you find yourself dealing with a version of the sort of straightforward racist practices that you find in all sorts of places. Mm but heightened by the fact that philosophers take themselves to be, you know, smarter than everyone, (laughs) clever than everyone. Yeah. Right. And so, and this is what Lou Outlaw taught me very clearly, very early in my career. Philosophy is kind of the perfect storm for a certain form of anti-black racism, right? Uh, Philosophy is about reason. Yeah. And the demonization of black folks has often been about the absence of reason. Right then it's going to be very hard for black folks to get traction in right. this space. Right. Right. Lewis, Gor- Lewis Gordon has also written beautifully about this. As yeah. well. So for all of these reasons, it's been a complicated right. space. So who, who did you write this book for? The short answer is I wrote it for me. And I say this in the beginning of the uh-huh. book. Uh-huh. Uh, this is the book I wish I had found when I started to discover the things I just shared with you. Okay. This is the book I wished I had been able to read when I was trying to figure out how to do aesthetics yeah. from the standpoint of a professional philosopher mm-hmm. while also attending to the kinds of questions that our colleagues in English and history and black studies and in other fields have already figured out how to take up and explore. Mm-hmm. So I wrote it for me, mm-hmm. um, but that doesn't yet distinguish it from all kinds of writing, right? The writing that takes itself seriously as writing is about working through some stuff for the writer. James Baldwin says this very beautifully, right? A writer can only... Right face in others what the writer is willing to face in himself Mm, mm -hmm. Uh, so it was for me but it was also for the field and for people who are interested in these questions and for people who wanted to think through these questions starting in a place relevantly similar to the place i was in right Right. people who had grown up reading certain kinds of texts who'd grown up thinking of certain ways of uh, articulating their arguments as appropriate Uh, so it was for those people as well Mm -hmm. And so from that perspective, it was kind of a, a bridge building book. It was, it was meant to be kind of a crossover book, right? So uh, one way I sometimes put it when I talk to people is that this is a book that was meant to provide a bridge for people in philosophy to make their way into conversations with people in black studies and in art history and in, other, in English and in other fields. Yeah. So what is, basically, let's just get to it. What is black aesthetics? We're going to stop right here and take a quick break. And we'll be right back. Can't draw a line around what I want. Guess that's the thing about where I'm from. Could have it all, it's never enough. In love, my nightmares and my dreams fall in love. It's for my generation striving, just pushing the ground. And all the people that be hustling nine to five. And all the kids that's motivated to keep us. And all my niggas that's been searching, just give it some time I was in a dark place, evil flowing all around my city Trying to put the poison in me, make a nigga feel defeated Got me staying to myself like everybody trying to kill me But I rise above the hate like smoke is leaving from a chimney What a cold world, focused on yourself and you ain't living Doing shit for other people, make a nigga heart prison I don't dwell on the past or the future, just the present If you live inside the moment, you can learn from every second Keep that negative shit on the other side My niggas open doors, letting more people inside I make them get involved Learn to believe in your life The coast is taking off Pushing to get through the fire Cause you A, B, twisting that lie 
la la And P.E.B. smoking that la 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 And F.C. always keeping that la 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 It's the coast, baby, sing a lullaby Well, come Get on Get your mind around what I want Yes, that's the That's the way it's taught Some might try to play you like a scrimmage Gotta stay sharp Often try to praise God Hoping that the pain stop That be when I know this Ain't no one gon' save the day, dog. All you got is you Don't let your presence go to waste You could pray like every day But take no steps and shit won't change I confess I ain't no saint Most our innocence is tainted But my thoughts are rearranged Now I get out and create it No funny shit Life a little more than by How fast you could money flip I find my happiness Spreading love not expecting shit Never step on others Just to get you some leverage Treat you like my brother Got your back I ain't hesitant People get too satisfied because they fear to grow Cause we underwear, they only share what they want us to know Shed a hundred tears, feeling trapped, thinking where do I go But I chose to grind like fucking nigga, go hard or go home UAB twisting that la 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 P.E.B. smoking that la 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 F.Z. always keeping that la 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 It's the coast, baby, sing a lullaby uh. What is black aesthetics? Okay. Uh, that is a, a deceptively simple question, <laughs> um, as are most questions. It mm-hmm. turns out this is why philosophy exists as a practice, because questions that sound easy, like what is the right thing to do, are actually pretty hard. <laughs> right. Um, so there are a handful of ways to answer it. I'll offer you a couple of them. Uh, for professional philosophers, Uh, I'll offer you three ways to answer it, I think. For professional philosophers, people who are trained the way I was trained to do the sort of thing I would do, um, or that I'm paid to do sometimes, uh, aesthetics is a field you study when you want to take up questions like, what is art? What is beauty? Um, And then there are a number of questions that um, have to do with the particular arts, like um, what are we doing when we enjoy uh, tragic narratives or horror narratives right mm-hmm. horror narratives are by definition horrible and so why would you subject yourself <laughs> to that? that's an interesting psychological and philosophical question mm-hmm. so aesthetics in the first instance is a field that takes up questions like that mm, okay. more broadly aesthetics is sort of an arena of inquiry a space for inquiry mm. that one takes up when one engages a certain dimension of experience okay. it's the dimension of experience that goes beyond instrumental utility, right? So one way I do, I introduce my students to this when I teach aesthetics is I invite them to go to like a a home goods store, right? Mm -hmm. And look at all of the different ways people have decided to make coffee mugs, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If you want to pour coffee in something and then pour it down your throat, you don't need it to be a new particular color or shape or have designs on it. But we do all of that because to put it very crudely, there is a, a, common impulse towards beautification or something Mm -hmm. uh, an impulse towards design or something Mm -hmm. and aesthetics is about that Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's another answer um so that's a way to think about what aesthetics is you asked me what black aesthetics is black aesthetics is a way of taking up questions like the ones i just pointed to Mm -hmm. specifically with respect to issues that arise from black life worlds or from the practices of anti-black or uh, practices of black racialization. Mm, okay. Um, so we can talk about how to think about race if you want, but assuming that people have a kind of basic right. sense of how they want to think about that. So uh, one of the things as you again, rightly noted in your introduction yeah. is, that we find defining black communities is a certain way of attending to the aesthetic dimensions of, of shared life. Uh, is that um, who sets and shapes the boundaries is, and the ideals is is what actually for black aesthetics. I'm sorry, say again. Who actually sh- what actually shapes the boundaries and influences black aesthetics? What is it? 
Uh, well, the short answer is um, the participants in the practices that we think of in relation to black aesthetics. That mm -hmm. is not a terribly satisfying answer, but I don't think there are terribly satisfying answers. <laughs> um, so one of the things I do in the book is argue that certain seductive and attractive ways of thinking about, about black aesthetics are actually misleading and problematic. What do I mean? Yeah. So one simple way to think about black aesthetics is that um, it's a field that studies the kinds of cultural productions that black folk produce. Right. right? And that's sort of right. But if you press on that a little bit, then you have to ask yourself questions about, you know, who are black folks and what kinds of things are appropriate to black folks. And one way of cashing out these thoughts leads to a kind of um, racial nationalism that or essentialism, some people would call it, that is very hard to make sense of. Right. And so why am I saying all of this? Because one way to answer your question, who draws the boundaries, mm -hmm. is to appeal to a kind of racial metaphysics, right? Okay. God drew the boundaries when he created the races, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Now, as it happens, most people think races don't work like that anymore. Races are things that humans create in the pra process of uh, creating social formations. Right. And so it can't be the case that God draws the boundaries between black music and white music. Mm -hmm. So what does... Uh, the answer I want to give is history and people, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things, in, in my view, that black aesthetics is about is questions like the one you asked, right? One of the questions at the heart of, so let me back up. Uh, so my basic claim in the book is that the black aesthetic tradition is a tradition of taking up and engaging certain kinds of recurring questions. Okay. One of those questions is what is black music? Right. right. And we answer that question by dipping into vast and profound stores of historical resources, mm -hmm. right? We have 400 years of people answering questions like this right. and engaging with those questions and those resources just is the work of black aesthetics. That's right. my view. Right. So th there's a, a part that I thought was interesting and I, I, I think it needs to be kind of defined and, 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 and talk about its impact on black aesthetics. You talk about black invisibility. Can you define mm -hmm. that and its impact? Oh, I can try. Um, <laughs> so the the easy way into the idea is to appeal to texts that, at least as far as I know, pretty much everyone who's been raised in the U.S. secondary schooling system has encountered. Uh, Ralph Ellison's A Visible Man. Right. Um, or failing that, Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. Both of these texts rely heavily on sort of visual metaphors to capture a certain kind of racialized experience. Mm -hmm. And it's the experience that Ellison's narrator describes very clearly and very thoroughly at the beginning of Invisible Man, right? This white dude bumped into me, but he didn't really see me. What mm -hmm. he saw was something else that was in his head. It wasn't dealing with me at all, right? right? And the point of that book in a certain way is to work through the experience of living in a society that refuses to see you for what you are, refuses to see your potential, your complexity, your perspectives, right? Mm -hmm. And instead interacts with stuff it puts in your place, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that's one way to think about invisibility. Uh, Tony Morrison in The Bluest Eye offers us a slightly different but related way, which has to do with the internalization of the things that Ellison is working through, right? The main character in The Bluest Eye can't see herself Right. Mm -hmm, because right. she wants to see some other kinds of things. Right. Um, so that that's sort of the easiest way into it. Uh, so, the condition of invisibility is a condition of being misrecognized. Or it's a kind of failure of recognition in relation to your social world. So what do you say about today with we feel like there's so much more of ourselves being presented on TV, um, not in as much as the monolithic way it used to be when they present it, show black people. What do you think about today? How how do we know uh, if the uh, black aesthetics we accept today has escaped the process of whitewashing? Right. How do we know that we're not kind of invisible? Are we invisible on some level? You know, um, mm -hmm. is 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 it truly the beauty uh, uh, we we believe in at uh, black beauty? We believe in H how do we know it's not influenced subtly by the others? Um, uh perception of us how do we know we'll be right back black 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 black
black, bitch. Black, black, black on black on black on black, 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 black on black, black. My thoughts so black, black, black on black. My skin is so black. I'm rocking on black. Everything is black. Black rims on these black wheels. Black is black. Black with this black on black. Black on black on black on black on black. This kid black tips black. Hill tracks like I'm six black. Hair blacker than black. Lips black. Even my dick black. Granddad Irish Trinidad. Guess I am half. I gotta go to ancestry.com. I think about the black. All the police ain't about the black. He's still a pig even though he black. Well, he got a lynch head in that. If you black, you dead in that. Strange fruit hang from a tree. On the leaves is red in that. Do it right like a Garveyite. Africa, I'm heading back. Niggas in the street, black on black. Killing with the heat. Bah, 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 bah. Cut off his heat. Put him in the shack. Man to moose, I been had the cash. Mix blacks to dilute black. Don't want blacks to produce black. Say black and they boot that. Orange is the new black. Black, 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 black on black, black my thoughts so black, black, black I'm black, my skin is so black, I'm rocking that black on black is black. black rims on this black, black wheels in this black, black wheel with this black, black bitch. Black, so black on black on black on black on black, 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 black on black, black my thoughts so black, black, black I'm black, my skin is so black, I'm rocking all black, everything is black. black rims on this black wheels in this black, black wheel with this black, black, black on black, 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 I'm with a new young queen and some illegal aliens I got a black fist barred up and it ain't just me, it's all us 400 years of oppression, I'm about to give me that black Tesla Black skid marks on the pavement, cops wanna see me in a black cage Black on black on black, Master Juba with the tap dance Gucci with the dapper Dan, tell him kiss my black ass Riding on a dino with the black mags Just another black man trying to stay about the cast yeah, black don't crack, matter of fact, where the fuck are 40 acres at? We black on black on black on black on black Black, black, black on black, black my thoughts so black Black, black I'm black, my skin is so black I'm rocking that black on black is black Rims on this black, wheels in this black Black, black, put this black, bitch So black on black on black on black on black Black, black, black on black, black my thoughts so black Black, black I'm black, my skin is so black I'm rocking all black, everything is black Rims on this black, wheels in this black Black, black, put this black on 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 Black. Black, black, black. Black on black, black. Yeah. So what do you say about today with we feel like there's so much more of ourselves being presented on TV, um, not in as much as the monolithic way it used to be when they present it, show black people. What do you think about today? How how do we know? Uh, if the uh, black aesthetics we accept today has escaped the process of whitewashing, right? How do we know that we're not kind of invisible? Are we invisible on some level? You know, um, mm -hmm. is 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 it truly the beauty uh, uh, we we believe in? At black beauty, we believe in. H how do we know it's not influenced subtly by the others' um, uh, perception of us? How do we know? Uh, these are very interesting questions. These are questions at the heart of the part of the black aesthetic tradition that takes up the issue of, invi of invisibility. Mm -hmm. um, you remember I, I mentioned that for me, black aesthetics is a tradition that's re defined by uh, determination to return to certain kinds of questions. The mm -hmm. question of invisibility or misrecognition is one of those. Um, as it happens, it's always been complicated in the ways that you point to, right? Mm -hmm. So I mentioned Ralph Ellison earlier. One of the responses to Ralph Ellison's stunning popularity came from some of the familiar figures in the black arts movement, some of whom said, yeah, I don't know why this dude feels like he's invisible. Invisible. He must be hanging out with the wrong people, mm -hmm. right? He needs to come hang out with some brothers and sisters. He won't be <laughs> right, right? right. And so one of the challenges in dealing with this question has to do with specifying the context in which the people we're interested in are circulating. Mm -hmm. So some scholars talk about this in terms of um, hidden transcripts of black life, right, that run on a different track from the dominant transcripts you find in white dominated spaces. Some scholars talk about black counter publics, right, mm -hmm. that are alternatives mm -hmm. to the dominant spaces. And it's so those moves are important because it's always been the case that mm -hmm. black folks create spaces to valorize themselves and tell themselves they're beautiful and all of that. Right. Uh, one of the challenges with that, though, is to figure out how to protect those spaces from the wider cultural forces that tell very different stories about yes. black beauty and black humanity. Right. Um, 
And so that's always been a kind of dynamic. Right. It's interesting now because it looks like things are in lots of ways better than they've ever been. Right. right. We got, you know, so, um, one of the sort of clearest tests for racial progress, some people think, is the opportunity for black folks to be mediocre just like everybody else. <laughs> yeah, right? right, right. And you got a whole bunch of mediocre black popular culture out there, right? Which isn't a criticism. That's mm -hmm. kind of how popular culture works. It's mm -hmm. a culture industry. We've got to crank out product, and a lot of it's going to be mediocre because that's just how industrial production works, right? Mm -hmm. And from that perspective, we got more stuff than we, but we got you know uninteresting black romantic comedies we got uninteresting black other thing well i could talk about black lightning as an uninteresting superhero narrative but <laughs> we probably don't go with the uh but we also have towering figures who excel at a very high at, in in very clear ways right mm -hmm. think of beyonce and yeah. think of jay-z and think of all kinds of people right. and so in some ways it's better than it's ever been right Nevertheless, right. I and I think many other people would suggest that these challenges still exist right. and they are still worth working through. And some of the best uh, examples of black cultural production in the current moment are ones that still take all this seriously. Right. Think of Queen Sugar, for example, or yeah. think about Insecure. Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, these are pro these are cultural artifacts that would not have existed 10 years ago. Right. right. Think of Greenleaf. Right? right. These are things that wouldn't have existed 10 years ago. Right. And so it's wonderful that they're here. But part of what's at stake for them is the the realization that they inhabit an environment that is still hostile to them in certain ways. Right. right? And that's a crucial dynamic. Right. I think the interesting thing is when, when, when you talk about black invisibility, you also start talking about their layer complexity. And, and I'll let you define that. But I think what's interesting is. You know, like you said, that there is a lot more out there of us being presented to the world. But at the same time, we kind of understand that whole black invisibility. Someone's looking at us. So we are at the same time thinking about what they're thinking about us. <laughs> it's this, this, the, these, these layers like that kind of kind of dilute or, you know, make it so complex what black aesthetics is because everybody's seeing it at different levels. So like the success of a show, the success of a song is that that's black. That's considered in the realm of black aesthetics. Is that considered because we accept it? Is it authentic to us or is it still the perception from the other that's saying it's authentic, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. Very good question. Uh, one thing to say is that uh, one of the sort of standing dangers of philosophical reflection, because that is what we are engaged in, I thank you for the opportunity to do that. One of the dangers is, um, and John Dewey wrote beautifully about this a uh, hundred years ago, um, a desire to remain at a level of abstraction at which the problems don't really become visible in the way that they need to right mm. so one of the things dewey and others i mean Locke in his way argued is that the real work of philosophical reflection comes when we descend from the point at which we articulate our principles to dig back into the real cultural conflicts at which those principles in which those principles become operative right, right. why am i saying this uh because you've asked a perfectly reasonable straightforward question about when things count as progress right or failure right, right. who judges that kind of thing and those are questions we can only answer by digging back into specific cases and specific interactions and specific cultural conflicts. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so we'd have to talk about particular uh, cases um, if we want to really do this work, which is why cultural criticism is so important, which is why it's so wonderful that there are there's been a proliferation of blogs and mm -hmm. you know, Twitter feeds and all sorts of new spaces for people to engage in this work. Um, so, yeah, I'll stop there. I, I, I took a yeah. detour from your question, so you might want to ask it again, and then I'll take another shot. No, no, I, I think what people need to understand is third-layer complexity, right? Mm -hmm. And when they understand that, it, it might help them kind of understand um, the role that plays in black aesthetics and its impact. Right. So this is interesting in part because this is also one of the sort of recurring features of what I'm calling the black aesthetic tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, you very helpfully described a setup in which there are these kinds of layers right of uh, recognition and interaction yeah. and evaluation and valuation that's very much what wb du bois was writing about when he talked about double consciousness it's very much like some of the things france fanon talks about when he adds another layer to double consciousness and says right 
not only am I looking at somebody looking at me, I'm looking at myself looking at somebody looking at me and trying to work through all of that. <laughs> yeah. right? Right. And that's a real experiential challenge. Mm -hmm. And you see that playing out in, for example, Dave Chappelle walking away from his show. Exactly. Right? Yep. Dave Chappelle, the whole point of that show, not the whole point, right. one of the crucial features of that show right. was that it took a kind of meta reflective stance on what black life and life in a racialized society was like. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain point, he says, I didn't know if people were laughing with me or at me. Right. right? And yes. I couldn't inhabit that space anymore. <laughs> so this is an ongoing challenge. Um, and it's a challenge that people push back on in different ways at different moments. Mm -hmm. This is kind of what's at stake in the wonderful, remarkable video that Jay-Z and Beyonce did in the Louvre. Oh, right? yeah. Hmm. They are self-consciously inhabiting a space that's imagined as the pinnacle, right, of Western cultural achievement. Right. And they're inhabiting it in a way that says, we belong to, look at what we've done, and let me put what we've done in conversation with the stuff in this remarkable building. Right. And then let's think about what all this means. Right. Right. I think that's a good point that you bring up. When you, in the book, you start talking about authenticity, right? And, you know, there's different camps. Is something often, uh, authentic if it's from where it's the origin and you get it from there? Or is it authentic if you just really believe in it and you feel the spirit of it? And you relating to the Jay-Z and Beyonce, we're in the museum. Everything in this museum should be considered authentic, right? But really, or, or is, it, is it really? You know, it's, uh, if you could talk about, you know, the complexities of, of authenticity, especially when it comes to black aesthetics. We'll be right back. Hold on. In the ghetto, we don't stay on the level. The days when they settled, it was paid by the devil. Road to the riches for the slaves on the pedal. Chains to the bar, still we caged by the metal. Or should I say, steal from the blood and the shield? Love us on the field and we loved on the real. Love when we thugs and the drugs we conceal. Love when we making people laugh, key and peel. Love how we feel when we dressed in our best. Hit the like button and invest in our stress. Life is a test that we keep trying to cheat on. Easier to dance through the time, put a beat on. We can get our freak on, but can't get our speak on. Eyes closed, can't see the light from the beacon. From a sunken place, we look up to the sky. Thinking we ain't really gonna get up till we die, nah. Rise up, raise up, get up, stand up. Rise up, wake up, sit up, man up. On the shirt, 600 on the shoes. shoes. Followed in the stores, and we wanted on the news. news. Look at who they choose for the face of a criminal. Slants in their views, and the hate is subliminal. Fact of the matter is, they hate the original. Man, wonder can I make these residuals? These individuals, bees in the critical. Getting preyed on by the thieves, and it's pitiful. How much does a dollar cost? Can we count the African slaves in the Holocaust? That's like 20 million strong. Natives to the land got so many million gone. I die hard. I'm Bruce Willis with the mood. Look how they wanna try to kill us with the food. From a sunken place, man, I stand victorious. Right up in your face, and it's glorious. Let's go. See, I'm just trying to teach you about what's going on.
If you're enjoying Book Speeds and Beyond, do us a favor. Go into the show notes of any episode, click on the iTunes logo to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. I think that's a good point that you bring up when you in the book, you start talking about authenticity. Right. And, you know, there's different camps is something often uh, authentic if it's from where it's the origin and you get it from there. Or is it authentic if you just really believe in it and you feel the spirit of it? And you relating to the Jay-Z and Beyonce, we're in the museum. Everything in this museum should be considered authentic. Right. But really, or, or is, is it really, you know, it's uh, if you could talk about, you know, the complexities of authenticity, especially when it comes to black aesthetics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, authenticity is extremely complicated, in part because it pretends sometimes not to be right. Mm -hmm. So one of the examples I use in the book is the example that comes from my own experience of being raised intellectually and culturally in an era at which black folk were trying to reclaim certain kinds of symbols like kente club. Right. Right. And so there were live and profound debates about what it meant for African-Americans to wear this thing from West Africa that they owned. Many of them, most of them didn't really understand and they weren't doing the right kinds of stuff with it. If you look at it from the perspective of the people who invented the weaving practice that create a kente cloth. Mm -hmm. And so there's a real question there about what it means to authentically inhabit some kind of African African diasporic cultural practice. Mm -hmm. So one way through this thicket of complex ideas and principles and norms for me is to distinguish two ethical postures, right? One thing we do when we take up ethical questions, because that's what authenticity talk is, it's an ethical challenge, right? You're inauthentic means you're bad in a certain way and you should reform or do something different. One way to take up these kinds of ethical questions is from the perspective of praising and blaming. You are bad, you are good, you've done something wrong, you need to change. Another way to take up these questions though is from the perspective of self-criticism and self-correction, right? What kinds of engagements and encounters do I need to have with myself to cultivate a virtuous character, mm -hmm. right? For me, authenticity talk pretends to be the first thing, right? It's a cudgel we use to beat each other up with mm -hmm. when it's really the second thing. It's a principle that we can appeal to as we think about our relationship to certain kinds of cultural objects. Okay. Right? Yeah. And so it's a kind of regulative principle. It's not a decision procedure. It's not something you can you know, point to somebody and say, you're doing it wrong, at least not most of the time. Mm -hmm. It's a way of inviting people to think hard about their relationship to stuff. Right. And so I'll close with this. I know I've been going on a long no, time. No, 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 that's fine. One, one key to this with respect to the Kente cloth example is, if you think about authenticity talk as a kind of ethical challenge that's bound up with the work of self-creation and self-cultivation, it can lead you to question the role of consumerism in your consumption of this artifact, right? Okay, yeah. Am I doing this because I'm trying to cultivate a certain kind of black bourgeois sensibility that's about wearing a kente bow tie, right? Or am I really trying to engage with some stuff from the African diasporic tradition? Mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. That's a hard question. Other people can't answer it for me. Right. But I can work on answering it for myself in better and better ways. Right. And, and that kind of leads into how you stated that you believe that we should assemble and not recover or discover what we've lost. Why? What's the difference between why? Why assemble versus discover? Mm -hmm. You know, because as black people, we feel like so much is lost. We want to find it again. But you're saying, mm -hmm. don't worry about that. Let's assemble. What do you mean? That's a very good question. It goes to the heart of the book. I thank you for asking it. It allows me to hopefully uh, clarify what I'm what I'm really up to and what's at stake. Uh, one of the challenges in thinking about culture in responsible ways is attending to the dynamism of culture. Mm -hmm. That's especially hard when it comes to populations that have been racialized in certain ways, because one of the achievements of Western racialization, of Western race thinking, has been removing certain people from the flow of history. Mm -hmm. Right. What do I mean? The clearest example for me growing up was I used to watch TV as before cable and all this stuff. And every once in a while, there'd be this um commercial about 
protecting the environment or something. And they'd have this crying oh, Native yeah. American, <laughs> right? Yep. To which I discovered some years later that lots of Native American communities were upset with this because they're like, we are not flies frozen in amber. We are human <laughs> beings who've grown and changed as history and context have changed around us. Right. And so we do this with indigenous peoples. We do this with black people. We lock them into a certain moment beyond which they cannot change. There's an anecdote from the book that's very helpful. A, a very important art historian named Sidney Caspier tells a story of working with some German filmmakers who wanted to film a Yoruba festival. Mm -hmm. And they filmed the festival. It was fine. They were in post-production. They were editing the raw footage. And they were cutting out all of the Pepsi cans and the yeah. watches and mm -hmm. the cell phones, mm -hmm. right? Because black folk don't have that <laughs> stuff, right? To be, yeah. to be African is to live in a hut, right? <laughs> and to wear a grass skirt. And a, you can't be part of the growth and change in culture that comes with being human. Mm. So mm. Um, this is one of the reasons I want to say thinking hard and responsibly about black cultural practice can't just be about recovering things because the things we want to recover were always and already in flux right okay. and so we have to figure out how to responsibly orient ourselves to certain kinds of historical and cultural resources while swimming with the flow of history as it goes on mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um i mentioned kente earlier I'll, I'll close my answer to this question by by bringing this in a certain way full circle the kente thing was part of a broader movement to recover certain kinds of clearly sort of i'll put this in scare quotes you can't see because you're not looking at me african <laughs> practices right? right so you have folk trying to wear african fabrics and all kinds of stuff and a lively industry grew up in east africa for cranking out this stuff right, right. and so we're gonna we're gonna make african shirts but what the people in the u.s didn't know was the people making the african shirts the so-called african shirts were using textiles from southern asia mm -hmm. they were using weaving practices they had been taught by a un program mm -hmm. they were based on west african traditions but they were using east african weavers right and so the thing that was supposed to signal an african tradition we are recovering was itself assembled out of a, a combination of peculiar resources right, right right and that's just kind of how culture works right. and so we have to embrace that no i think that that's a fair point because um i try to tell my brothers and sisters that we've been on this planet for a long time and there's a lot of history, but to mm -hmm. have history, you have to assemble what's going on in the present. Right. And then it becomes mm -hmm. history. So yes, mm -hmm. look back in the past. It's, it's great to do that because it's important. We, we're, we're learning every other, everybody else's history in America besides our own. So it's good to get that. But at the same time, Let's re, 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 let's not forget that we do a great job of innovating and inventing and assembling uh, a culture today that is being emulated by others. Right. And mm -hmm. um, I think that's a great point. And I, I, I want to dive more into when we talk about expressive culture, black expressive culture and how you talked about um, how our our expressive culture is linked to our political activity like like Karis one has been quoted saying hip-hop is a way of life it seems mm -hmm. like we are the only people who associate our music with all aspects of our lives most notably politics and i was wondering why is this what is it about that we'll be right back Because black don't age, literally we miss a mark because we reach our grave. Black don't crack and 
black show as hell don't cave Black boys are targets, I don't exaggerate Whips and chains, yet we still navigate These systematic pitfalls that's meant to agitate Teleprompters tell lies and they try to disguise The billion dollar prison system that be taking our lives Pill attitudes, hip hop, they make zombies They turn pain into a corporate monopoly Such an atrocity, more than life than what's got to be Shown on the surface, I try to think logically Try to tell me how, it ain't as bad as it sound I see mothers grieving, putting their sons in the ground As I turn on the news, the world ain't got a clue All the mayhem on the tube, I don't know what I should do Black don't cry, don't cry Not even when we under attack Always known to bounce right back Black don't crack, don't cry Black don't cry Black don't cry, don't cry Black don't cry Black don't cry, don't cry Okay, yo to all the killers in the hundred dollar villas We gotta be protectors of the village Willie Lynch methods try to stop and suppress us Modern day slaves, they attack and arrest us When we talk about expressive culture, black expressive culture And how you talked about um, how our, our expressive culture is l- linked to our political activity like like Karis one has been quoted saying hip hop is a way of life it seems mm-hmm. like we are the only people who associate our music with all aspects of our lives most notably politics and i was wondering why is this what is it about that hmm. there are interesting stories to tell about the relationship between um, afro u.s life in particular um African diasporic life in the Americas a little more broadly, and music. Um, the stories are to some degree evidence-driven stories, and so I'll offer you, I'll write you a blank check for a story that an historian or somebody or an anthropologist would have to cash. <laughs> um, but there are there are things that we can point to that are very interesting. Before I point to them, I do want to say um, one of the things we sometimes do when we think about uh, black culture is we downplay the degree to which the thing we call black culture is continuous with other kinds of cultural practices. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to move too swiftly into the thought that there's something radically distinct about black culture with respect to its engagement with politics. Right. You Mm -hmm. think about lots of cultural traditions around the world that do something similar, but there is an interestingly unique story to tell about the way black culture does this. So that's just a long disclaimer. Mm -hmm. Um, So one of the things people sometimes point to is the way that lots of avenues for aspiration and excellence were foreclosed for Afro-U.S. peoples, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Think about in particular in the wake of the uh, first reconstruction. Um, You think about, you know, every time black folk tried to rise up in business or industry or politics, they get smacked down violently, right? right? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, With lethal violence, in fact, Mm -hmm. right? But other sorts of pursuits were not foreclosed in quite the same way, right? For straightforwardly racist reasons, right? If being black is not about reason, but is instead about being expressive, uh-huh, right. then white supremacy is not threatened when black folks excel at music because mm-hmm. that's what blackness is about, mm-hmm. right? And so there's a way in which that space remained open and available while others were much more rigorously policed. Mm-hmm. And so that space became, Cornel West has written wonderfully about this, Lewis Gordon has written about this, that space became a space in which black excellence, right, black creativity, black intellectual excellence could manifest itself in ways that were not as available elsewhere. Right. Um, And so that became the space to go if you wanted to bring a certain kind of cultural critique to bear, work through a certain set of issues, right, or engage with uh, challenges in black life in certain ways or engagement with, with triumphs in black life in certain ways. Right. And so something like that seems to be involved in the way uh, black expressive culture gets bound up with the broader project of creating black life in mm-hmm. the U.S. Um, so th- and then it plays out in all sorts of very interesting ways, as you've noted. So knowing that you know, uh, ex- black expressive culture has been b- to 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 um, express itself politically. It was in, like you said, it was in there, and that makes sense because it was a space that we were known to excel in, and 
And I think more for reasons because it was just so innate that others couldn't excel the way we did. And, and that's all we were, we were just forced in that predicament. So we were able to excel at that. What I want to know is today with black aesthetics, with, with politics, um, people sometimes judge the artist saying that, Hey, what you're putting out there is hurting the community. What you're not being a role model right now. Um, should an artist artist be separated from the ethical ju- judgment and political criticism? This is one of the tough and abiding questions of philosophical aesthetics, right? Yeah. What is the relationship between ethical evaluation and aesthetic evaluation? Um, it would take a lot of work and time to craft a, an airtight answer that yeah. we would we would accept. Um, but I think many people accept that there must be some point at which ethical evaluation must be brought to bear on aesthetic activity. The question is what that point, where that point is and what relationship it has to the experience of art or aesthetic objects. Right. What do I mean? I mean, sometimes when we talk about art, we, we lapse into a, space in which we pretend that art is hermetically sealed off from the rest of the world Hmm. right Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, we pretend that there are not business models right that frame the way artworks get out to the public we pretend that there are not different parts of the public that are differently served by different institutions we pretend less often but still sometimes that there are not culture industries hovering on the margins of the thing we might call the art world world looking for the next thing they can go sell and so forth right Mm -hmm. and so one of the things that has to happen and does happen uh with uh, somewhat encouraging regularity is that people have to prepare themselves position themselves to bring a certain kind of political critique to bear on the way culture is produced and distributed economically and politically right so this is the kind of thing you see when people protest Uh, MoMA or the Brooklyn Museum, right, when they say these institutions are rooted in communities they are not a part of, right? Right. And we need to do some work to make the community answer or the institution answer to the community. So for me, that's the interesting space where the ethical questions live, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's harder to make the ethical questions live in the work and in the heart and the head of the artist, Mm -hmm. right? This is the challenge of Dave Chappelle, right? What is it that I'm doing? How can I make sense of this morally and ethically? That's harder. That's that's a, that's a spiritual space, right? Where you right. have to deal with the life plan of this agent, this person, this subject. But the political critique is a little more straightforward, and the stakes are clearer. Right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Right. Right. So, so, but what role should black black aesthetics, black art, play in the fight against white supremacy? You know, since we've been so locked into just the exp- our expressive culture and and you know through that we've expressed our our political views mm-hmm. uh, so but but the, what role is should it should should our should our aesthetics just be just be you know just be it doesn't really need to do anything against white supremacy or is there a role that it needs to play mm-hmm. This, too, is one of the deep and abiding questions of aesthetic theory generally and black aesthetics in particular. Uh, This is one of the recurring questions that I put at the heart or I find at the heart of the black aesthetic tradition. What exactly should our artists be doing? Elaine Locke and and Du Bois argued about this uh, quite publicly and famously early in the 20th century. Um, I don't think there are... It's often the case that people argue about this in ways that underrepresent the complexity of the situation, right? So what do I mean? I mean, we talked a little while ago about what aesthetics is. One of the things aesthetics is, is a way of responding to what you might think of as a kind of innate feature of the human condition. We have a kind of beautifying impulse, Mm -hmm. right? And aesthetic practice emerges from that impulse. So one of the things aesthetics should do is honor and credit that impulse, Mm -hmm. right? Along the way, it can do some other things as well, but it becomes very difficult when we want the other things to overwhelm the work of aesthetic practice and crediting and honoring that basic impulse, Mm -hmm. right? Right. But 
because we are social beings, one of the things that we will do is use aesthetic practice to engage with the conditions of our lives and of our shared lives. Mm -hmm. And so I hesitate to dictate to artists and say, you must be doing this or you should be doing that. I'm much more comfortable saying, just given what humans are and given what culture is, you're going to have artists engaging with this stuff in certain kinds of ways. Yeah. And some of that will involve engaging with the conditions under which certain people are racialized as black and dealing with the things that come with them. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I am comfortable articulating as something like an ethical injunction is the injunction for artists to engage critically and responsibly with the conditions under which they do their work and their work gets distributed. Right. Okay. And so if you think about the burden of the artist being, as I keep saying, to credit and honor this impulse, then, and this is where Du Bois starts in his famous essay or address criteria of Negro art, you have to think about the way white supremacist cultures constrain opportunities mm. right, for people racialized as black to engage that basic aesthetic impulse, mm. right? Michelle mm -hmm. Wallace wrote beautifully about this at the end of the 20th century, right? It talks about racialized restraint of trade. It right. keeps black artists out of the art world, keeps you out of the galleries, keeps you out of the museums, right? So even if you take the, the basic aesthetic impulse as the core of the enterprise, it leads you very directly into other kinds of political and ethical critique, mm -hmm. right? And it should do that. Right. And from there, it's a short step to doing the broader thing of engaging with the broader conditions of uh, white supremacy. And that, that was the line Du Bois took. Right. So, so you just brought up the idea of a resistance of trade, you know, um, and like you said, that's used to explain the exclusion of artists from contributing to Western culture. Why has hip hop music not felt this same long term pressure of trying to be recognized? Because it's global, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, with with that question, if you can also answer, when looking at when looking at um, our art, when looking at music in particular, hip hop, a part of Black invisibility to me still exists, right? I feel like sometimes. A lot of us are frustrated because when we see something on TV, we feel like that's not the perception of us. We feel like that's the perception of the other of us, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, talking about the the black invisibility and then and the resistance of trade, how how is hip hop being recognized globally in this sense, dealing with all of this? And is do you think hip hop is being represented the way it should? We'll be right back. Time in between thoughts. Time in between. Time. Time in between thoughts. Time in between thoughts. Time in between thoughts. Time. In between. Stones and sticks, we own the shift the culture Golden ticket, the flow is Willy Wonka OCD, obsessive, compulsive I flow too clean to test diagnosis They suggest a higher dosage But drugs can't cure me I admit it to my sickness Before the judge and the jury Madman on my Don Draper But I'm still a class act Megatron 81 Lebanon Beirut Civil war in my mental core Fighting against myself I look in the mirror toward you They said I was a bright child Brain LED Now they tryna put my lights out And leave a shell of me I hung around the white crowd No gang felonies Still America's most wanted O'Shea LP Oh they tryna claim I'm a criminal Who me? Defamation of character Nah Straight to my face of subliminal Who me? That's defamation of character, uh, my personality, it might just split. I'm in between a rock and righteousness. My personality, it might just split. I'm in between a rock and righteousness. This is your brain on cocaine songs, but my niggas, please hang on, just hang on. I'm in the kitchen like Ray Kwan, Chef Apron, over the stove with the flame on, Wolfgang sauce. Champion sound, yours ambient style. Way too many flows, I'ma start handing them down. Goodwill, till Emmett gets real justice. I'm still busting through by cuspids to feel something. People shoot to kill, hunting automatic weapons like smartphones. In every household, like big farm codes. Drug 
industry, the gun industry, hey, it's all the same, they love killing me, they call it free publicity, I can see why some people flip out, now you see why we wanna dip out, panic leads to frenzy, and in return the frenzy leads to panic, I might move to Canada, if not I might just leave the planet, oh they tryna claim I'm a criminal, who me, defamation of character, straight to my face a subliminal, can't be me, that's defamation of character, when looking at music in particular hip-hop a part of black invisibility to me still exists right i feel like sometimes a, a lot of us are frustrated because when we see something on tv we feel like that's not the perception of us we feel like that's the perception of the other of us right so mm -hmm. uh, you know talking about the the black invisibility and then and the resistance of trade how how is hip hop being recognized globally in this sense dealing with all of this and is do you think hip hop is being represented the way it should good uh this question very helpfully brings together a lot of the the threads we've been pulling during the course of this this conversation uh one of the features of racialized invisibility that i and some others want to talk about is is very much like what you just pointed to right it's a version of what Ellison talks about, mm -hmm. but it's what happens when certain kinds of stock figures or characters stand in for the complexity of the real person or the real practice or the real community All right. right? that's in the world. Some people would say, I think rightly, that commercial hip hop plays exactly this role. Right. So mm -hmm. what it is to be a hip hop artist in the minds of people who have been unduly influenced by a kind of commercial vision of what hip hop is, is to be a certain kind of what a long time ago we would have called a gangster rapper. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. That's that's just what it is in response to which people who inhabit any of the very diverse hip hop communities in more local spaces around the country and around the world will say, well, no, that's not what we're about. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And that gap points us to a thing we were talking about a second ago with respect to a kind of political economy of aesthetic and cultural production, right? Mm -hmm. There's big business in selling a certain vision of black life, right. right? That overwhelms a more complex vision that involves people doing different kinds of things, right? Writing different kinds of music and so forth. And so that goes back to the thing we were saying earlier about the way a certain anti-black vision of black life makes it possible for black achievement to run in certain channels, right. right? And so this is part of the answer to your question about how even in a context defined by Wallace's restraint of trade, mm -hmm. how is it that we get these black folk, right, uh, inhabiting this extraordinarily or living the, or working through these extraordinarily lucrative commercial spaces with respect to a certain kind of black culture? Well, because that's a vision of black culture that's very easy to sell. Right. It's about guns and violence yep. and misogyny and so forth. And it's not about the real things that many people would argue are happening in real sort of on the ground hip hop communities that are not curated simply for the sake of making money. Right. right? So the shorthand for me for this was very early in my life when I was you know, scrambling around trying to get my hustle on. I worked in what we then called a record store mm -hmm. and I discovered to my alarm then this is in Atlanta. Um, I discovered that. All the people coming in buying Easy E and NWA and all that were these white stockbrokers working oh. <laughs> in downtown Atlanta. Yeah. Right. How'd you feel about because that? I felt a certain kind of way about that. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> what is happening here? Mm. And what is happening is the same thing that has happened, many people would say, uh, throughout at least the last 150 years or so of black culture in the U.S. in particular. This isn't specific to hip hop, right? This mm. happens over and over and over. Right. right. Black mm. music and the cultures that grew up around black music invite people to endorse, accept, imagine a certain vision of human possibility. That vision has to do with being an outlaw or being a rebel or being yeah. something like that. Yeah. And then that vision gets taken up and sold as blackness. Right, right. You, think, you can think about this with respect to minstrel shows. You can think about jazz. You can yeah. think about blues. You can think about all of it. And it runs in very similar ways. And so all of these things, invisibility, political economy of pr cultural production, restraint of trade, racialized images of anti-black images of black life, they all come together around hip hop, which mm -hmm. make it extremely complicated and rich. Yeah. And, and the, when you talked about the, the, the Yoruba and how they didn't want to have the watches in the picture and so forth because they didn't feel that's like what they needed, they should have. 
I kind of see that when it comes to hip hop. I think, mm-hmm. in, in my, in just in my my view and others is, that's why I feel like we don't see much of our political activity in the mainstream hip hop. I feel like the other wants to assemble a, a, assemble a way of what we should look like. It wants to maintain white supremacy in a certain way, thus kind of keeping us still invisible in a sense. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's why we're not seeing the politics in the music like we used to see back in the day with with Public Enemy and the X Clan and and all those, or is it just a shift in our assembly of black aesthetics? Where where are we with that? Well, um, so to a considerable degree, these are empirical questions, right? Just how much hip hop is Mm. actually sort of politically challenging versus how much is doing some other stuff. Uh, And I just don't know, you know, the empirical lay of the land with respect to that. I I share your, your uh, hypothesis, uh, but I do want to make clear that there are sort of, there are real sort of facts of the matter here that we could helpfully get some music industry person to help (laughs) us with. Um, But if something like that is right, uh, what does it mean? Um, one of the things that it means, I think, is that we should be extremely grateful for folk like Beyonce, mm. right? Because Beyonce uses this space mm-hmm. precisely to push back against the kinds of things you're talking about, right? Mm-hmm. Think about the video she does. Think about the Lemonade series of, of visual artifacts and musical artifacts. Mm-hmm. Think about the Louvre, the video in the Louvre. Um, and I know the name of it. I'm not saying it because I don't know if I can say that on you. <laughs> She is explicitly and self-consciously curating a vision of black life that is more complex Uh than the stuff we get from the usual suspects. Mm -hmm. And she's using this, to some degree, unparalleled uh, clout in the industry to make this happen. Mm -hmm. And she's doing it in conversation with people from other art worlds, right? She right. and Jay's, I don't know this story intimately because I'm not a, a, I'm not a member of the Bayhive, right? But I <laughs> attend with some pair to some of this. Uh, but she and Beyonce had, you know, long conversations with practicing artists, right? And practicing cultural theorists and art historians about how to think about the thing they're doing and what it means right, for right. them to do their work in mm-hmm. relation to this industry and to other traditions of cultural production. Mm-hmm. And so, the forces you're pointing to and worrying about are real and powerful and distressing, right? They, they want us to accept a vision of black life and achievement and cultural expression that runs along certain very delimiting channels, right? Mm-hmm. But then we have people who are doing something different, right? right? This is why I'm so grateful for Ava DuVernay, mm, right? Yes. This is why I'm grateful in a very different way that's also complicated that we'd have to talk about. Mm-hmm. For LeBron James, right? There are people who are using their position. Mm-hmm. to make room for other people to maneuver right right, right. and they're not the first obviously not the first right to do this. right part of the story of the new negro movement in the early 20th century this part of the story of spike lee is part of the story of tony morrison working as an editor at random right. house right right but they scaled it up in ways that it had to be scaled up to contend with this immense and voracious culture industry that is doing the dire things that you've pointed to. Right. And I, I, I like how you brought up Beyonce because Beyonce kind of touches on something in your book as well. Um, if you permit me talking about monstrous intimacy, you know, she's very successful, but yet at the same time, a black woman's aesthetics plays a major role in, in, in black culture. So can you talk about monstrous, monstrous intimacy and maybe relate that to Beyonce? Because Beyonce is all about the people. She really is. Right. And I, I don't like to criticize it, this as, as much, but I have to put it out there. There's a natural hair movement and then there's there's the weaves and, and so forth. So you see what I'm getting at? Beyonce is pushing the the, the, the limits of black culture. But yet at the same time she's within the weave should she be criticized for that or how does this relate to monstrous intimacy we'll be right back oh yeah it's that it's that two-stepping y'all i need everybody to dance for this two-step to this oh boy hey (laughs) ladies and gentlemen ladies and gentlemen i'd like to introduce the talented the wonderful the lovely my sister hey brie brown I 
I checked my feet uh, under a picture. I saw a tweet, a black man named Richard. He goes by Rick. Said the sister look good for a dark skin chick. Look, Rick, that's not a compliment. You caught up in the mind tricks of Willie Lynch. He told the slave owners this turn complexion to a competition. Make them jealous of each other, that's the mission. Separate them by the gender and their color skin is. Treat the offspring of your rape real different and to mix them into the house and into the kitchen. The slipped in will be the dark slave's ambition. 300 years later, and some minds are still conditioned. We're wishing for straight hair to be light skinned. But listen, you could be either I'm Vivian. Black is beautiful and every shade it isn't. Coco Cappuccino, honey brown. Love your skin, you're in strut in your crown. You're beautiful. God made you beautiful, don't you know? Uh, what is good hair? I wanna know. Is it not good if it's worn natural? I think that all hair is good if it's yours And it's yours if it's grown or it's bought from stores You can spend plenty on Brazilian and Indian Remy Weave it all through your hair if you think it looks pretty But queen, you're beautiful with it, you're beautiful without it If you hear that only straight hair makes you beautiful, then doubt it Don't fall for these Willie Lynch mind tricks Look in the mirror and shout this up to you to wear an updo a afro braids wet set lace front locks of corn rolls love yourself in every hairstyle be proud our queens wear crowns some are weaving it down hey. coco cappuccino honey brown love the skin you're in strut in your crown you're beautiful And I, I, I like how you brought up Beyonce because Beyonce kind of touches on something in your book as well, um, if you permit me. Talking about monstrous intimacy, you know, she's very successful, but yet at the same time, a black woman's aesthetics plays a major role in, in, in black culture. So <laughs> can you talk about monstrous, monstrous intimacy and maybe relate that to Beyonce? Because Beyonce is all about the people. She really is, right? And I, I, I don't like to criticize it, this uh, as, as much, but I have to put it out there. There's a natural hair movement, and then there's, there's the weaves and, and so forth. So you see what I'm getting at? Beyonce is pushing the, 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 the limits of black culture, but yet at the same time, she's within the weave should she be criticized for that or how does this relate to monstrous intimacy yeah uh that's interesting i hadn't thought about it in quite that uh configuration of 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 ideas um so part of what you're after i think is one of the things i, I think i point to in the book there was a bit of a furor at one point in in beyonce's career this must have been about 10 years ago now uh, when it hit the news that she had gotten some like sixty thousand dollar weave or something yeah right? And it was all over the uh, the sort of gossip sites and so forth. Um, and so one thing to say about that is, well, look, if you're about black folk, then maybe you shouldn't be about a vision of black folk that requires straightened hair, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. there's a, there are complexities there. Mm -hmm. um, for me, this is one of the reasons I want to be careful with the idea of authenticity, right? So there's a way to raise this worry through the idea of authenticity, right? right. And it goes something like this. One way to be authentically black or the, 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 the authentic way to inhabit a black vision of bodily beauty is to insist on natural hairstyle. <laughs> right, right. And to fail to do that is to be inauthentic because straightened hair is not authentically black you got to do stuff to your body to make it do this and to make it do this is to aspire to be to inhabit a white aesthetic or something like that mm -hmm. I, it's easy to see how one might raise this worry and where it comes from um it's easy to see especially if you put it in the context of ongoing work that sociologists and anthropologists are doing about the deleterious impact of what you might think of as european beauty standards in african diasporic cultures around the world think mm. about skin bleaching right. creams and the scams that go with that and the physical dangers that come with that you think about all sorts of things right 
But there's another side to it. And Robin Kelly wrote wonderfully about this very early in his career in an essay on Malcolm X. He says, look, people are running the same line on Malcolm, right? Malcolm, Malcolm runs it on himself. He says, I was brainwashed by the white devil because early in my career I had a conk and I was blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And Kelly says, but let's think a little harder about what was happening during the Zoot Suit era and the conk era. No white man in the U.S. in the 1930s had hair that looked like a black man's conked hair. Okay. That was a distinctively black style mm-hmm. that was sort of superficially similar to something you might think of as aspiring to whiteness. But it was about doing something distinctively black. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. One might argue that there's a way of inhabiting weave culture that's the same, that's very much like this, right? So you think about the weave culture that grows out of West Africa and Nigeria and certain places. You think about the way weaves figure in black women's beauty practices in a way it doesn't for white women. So there's a there's a richer story to tell that makes me hesitate to run that whole argument for Beyonce. Yeah, it's 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 a really difficult one. That's why when you were talking in your book about assembling culture, it it, it mm-hmm. kind of made sense because sometimes when you see that you think okay we still have this eurocentric force behind us that's pushing us to look at ourselves in certain ways like you said the others looking at us so we see them looking at us so what can we do to main uh push through these forces of white supremacy Mm -hmm. but but at the same time you're like well, maybe maybe it's just this is just how humanity goes as as culture, as these influences come together, as these cultures come together, things are being assembled. You're still creating a black culture, although there's all these other forces that are coming at you. You can almost say right. that almost for any any other culture, they're going to be influenced as time goes on. But I guess there's just something unique about us is that we were brought broken from we were taken from a culture. It wasn't more of um, a, a, a volunteer to move to this culture. So the whole assembly part is an interesting part about, about your book. And I never thought about assembling a culture, which I think is, is kind of cathartic in a way because you can, we, as, as black people, we can get really depressed if we try to focus on what we've lost, you know, we're, we're mm-hmm. going to work on getting that back. But knowing that through our innovation, through, through our ingenuity, that we are creating a culture, assembling a culture, that should be, that should be, uh, we should feel proud about that. Right. In, in a yep. sense. Right. Yep. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. right. I couldn't right. agree more. Right. So, so what is it about, when you wrote this book, how did, how did it change you? Because you said this was something you always wanted to do. So how has it changed you since you've done it? Oh, I don't know that it changed me a lot. It did what uh, writing a book or, or engaging in any sustained writing uh, can at its best do for the writer. It, it clarified some things for me. It allowed me to work through some thoughts that I had begun to have but had not uh, hammered out completely, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so if, if there's a change, it is a change in the direction of greater clarity, right? I have a clearer sense of the kinds of things I wanted to say when I started the book, and now I know what it means to say those things, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, it changed me a little bit professionally just because the book has been received pretty well in my field mm-hmm. and has gotten people, more people into the conversation around these things. Mm-hmm. Uh, but beyond that, it, it has been an exercise in self-clarification, which is in a way what expression is. It's in a way what art is about. And so that's been very gratifying. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, tying in, you know, black aesthetics with philosophy, do you see your colleagues? Um, is this kind of help pushing the the boundaries of helping us to uh, I guess philosophize and 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 and, uh, and express ourselves through uh, through our blackness. Be- and, and what I'm trying to get at is knowing that pred- your predominantly your field of philosophy is white. Um, is is our f- black philosophers coming to a point where it's almost like we don't really kind of care what they think because inside that field itself i'm thinking even as in as much as intelligent as you guys are you guys are still invisible in that sense right so pushing the boundaries with your work like this is this going to help 
erase that invisibility a little bit for the philosopher. We'll be right back. Keep it moving, keep grinding. What, 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 what? Yo, what's up? I see you shining. Yeah, I'm with that. Keep it moving, keep vibing. That I'm rhyming, I'm back And it's a fact, we black and we face obstacles Most of the time, the world's cold is a popsicle And it's a ripple effect with negative energy Bickering with the devil, he want me back on the Hennessy We all look for belonging and validation Mostly from the peoples without the certification okay. Rumors start and we want the notification But when it's time to show love, we lack the motivation Social class is a past that equal mercy They ban Kaepernick and still selling his jerseys They want us out buying Patron, buying some rock That's why Diddy's still the richest man on the block And he ain't had an artist popping since Young Jock They see the alcohol or they killing us with the cops Man, but on the real, some of you gotta stop The songs you putting out is half of the roadblock What's up? Tying in, you know, black aesthetics with philosophy. Do you see your colleagues? Um, is this kind of help pushing the the boundaries of helping us to, uh, I guess, philosophy and 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 and, uh, and express ourselves through uh, through our blackness? And, and what I'm trying to get at is. Knowing that your predominantly your field of philosophy is white, um, is is are black philosophers coming to a point where it's almost like we don't really kind of care what they think because inside that field itself, I'm thinking even as in as much as you, intelligent as you guys are, you guys are still s- s- invisible in that sense, right? So pushing the boundaries with your work like this is this going to help? erase that invisibility a little bit for the philosopher oh i don't know philosophy is a complicated space (laughs) it's like it's like um a great many uh predominantly white spaces or majority spaces you might say in this context um we could talk about the politics of majority minority language which is why i don't usually use it but you know what i mean when i refer to that way yeah. Uh, one of the complexities one finds in these spaces is that nowadays in particular, there is v- quite ready acceptance of a few folks, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, exceptional Negro, one might call it in an unkind spirit. Um, and that's been true in philosophy as it has been in lots of other spaces, right? We've had uh people of color at the highest reaches of the profession for president of the apa and you know all that kind of business um and that way was paved to a considerable degree by some of the people who trained me howard mcgarry and lou outlaw it was paved also by kwame anthony appia who's become quite well known as a writer for the new york review of books but is on the faculty of nyu was at princeton before that um and so there are there are we've had our obamas in philosophy (laughs) okay but just as President Obama's administration in lots of ways did not materially change the prospects for black folks at large, mm-hmm. right? just as you can have Obama in the White House at the same time you got Michael Brown lying in the street in Ferguson, mm-hmm. right. you can have black folk at the head of the APA while the practices that underwrite the institution of the APA and the institution of professional philosophy continue to make it hard for some of us to imagine a life in this profession. Mm-hmm. I remain fairly ambivalent about the profession. There are more people in it and there are more people of color in it than there used to be. And mm-hmm. there are people who can aspire to things they didn't used to. We got black folk on the faculty at Ivy League institutions, which for many people is a mark of success mm-hmm. and rightly so uh, to a certain degree. Uh, but the profession itself still presents individual folks who have not at- at- achieved at that level. Mm-hmm. Uh, presents them with the same, some of the same challenges that they would have faced 10, 20, 30 years ago. Um, and that's discouraging. Right. Um, Anita Allen, uh, I mentioned Anita Allen earlier. She has written beautifully about this. She left philosophy for a long time. She got a PhD in philosophy and a JD from Harvard Law School. 
And she just went to the lawyer track. She taught it in law schools and said, I don't want to deal with this foolishness in philosophy. And why would I, if I'm smart enough to do philosophy, because philosophy is hard, you got to be smart to do it. If I'm smart enough to do that, I'm smart enough to do some other stuff mm-hmm. that will pay me more. And I won't deal with the foolishness that comes with philosophy. <laughs> the best thing in the world. Mm-hmm. Right. And she recently came back, fairly recently came back to philosophy in part to help make change, but in part because it had changed a little. Mm-hmm. But that basic dynamic is still there. Right. For a lot of people, if I can do this, I can do something else without this foolishness. Right. right? I, and that's it's hard to see that changing profoundly in the near term. Right. I was always thinking in my in my head, I wonder when the day will you you will have kind of running through philosophy is people like the Marcus Garvey kind of philosophy. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's that's. Do you see that on the horizon or there's a lot way to go for someone like Marcus Garvey to be accepted in to the canon of, you know, the traditional philosophy. Well, uh, so I've been very hard on my colleagues. I will, I will take this opportunity to throw them a bone. One of the encouraging things about philosophy in recent years has been the degree to which in lots of spaces, the canon has been expanded, changed, criticized, um, more than expanding the canon, we have gotten better about imagining the canon as an inherently dynamic and organic thing that grows and changes. Mm -hmm. And so there are people who will teach Marcus Garvey. There are people. So it used to be the case when I first entered this profession that the only Negro you see on a syllabus might be Martin King. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. That's it. And then for a while it was Martin King, maybe Audre Lorde and maybe Mm -hmm. Cornel West. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But now there are there are many more people realize that there are many more options, some of which you have to dig back into the segregated prehistory of professional philosophy to work through, right? Mm -hmm. Like Alain Locke. Um, So that has changed. And one beneficiary of that change has been uh, someone like Tommy Curry, beneficiary may be strong. Uh, Tommy Curry, as you probably know, teaches at Texas A&M and takes a very hard, what some people think of as a very hard line on some things with respect to gender and racial issues. And in part for that reason has come in for some very severe criticism to the point of getting death threats and things like that. Right. right? We interviewed him and he, he tells, you know, just what he wants to express in philosophy, um, Mm -hmm. is like you said, it's, it's, it's hard to, get a footing in, you know, like you said, he's definitely getting death threats. Yeah. Right. Uh, but Tommy got tenure at Texas A&M, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That probably wouldn't happen a number of years ago. And, and it happened only because the mostly white folks in that space recognized that he was doing a kind of work with a kind of rigor, right? Mm-hmm. That met their standards, irrespective of its political content, Mm, right? mm -hmm. Um, That is an encouraging development. Mm -hmm. It comes with all sorts of very discouraging things, especially for Tommy, and I'm sorry he's had... Oh, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But yeah, that the fact that he can have that, that we can tell this story Mm -hmm. is a sign that some things are changing. Now, Tommy is a challenging figure in lots of other ways. He's had very challenging relationships with our black feminist colleagues. Mm -hmm. And there are, there's a deeper story to tell about that, Mm -hmm. that we can't go into probably, but I do want to flag that for Mm -hmm. your listeners. Mm -hmm. Um, so what, 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 what do you want people, the reader to truly take away from this book? Oh, I think uh, maybe three things. Uh, One is the thing we keep coming back to, the idea of assembly um, over some of its alternatives, right? Assembly over discovery or assembly over birth or something like that, right? That culture and black culture in particular is something that people curate and build and revise and change over time. And if we want to engage responsibly with it, we have to take that feature of it seriously. Mm -hmm. Uh, Second thing is the thing I talked about a a good while ago with respect to the idea of authenticity i probably didn't put it as clearly as i might our discussion of beyonce allows me to put it a little more carefully and and very briefly now Uh, you invited us to think about what it means that beyonce deals with her hair in the way she does for me that's a paradigm case for the way of thinking about authenticity that i want to recommend Mm -hmm. i don't know what that woman's thinking Right. Mm -hmm. There are lots. There's a way in which having straightened hair for a black woman can be overdetermined. There are lots of things you might have in mind that lead you down that path. Mm -hmm. I don't know which ones led you down that path. 
you may not know which one's led you down that path. Mm -hmm. But authenticity talk is most responsibly construed as an invitation to think through the conditions of your own choices. Mm -hmm. Why did I make that choice? Mm -hmm. Am I doing it because I want to be white? Am I doing it because of this other stuff? Am I doing it for the reasons Robin Kelly attributed to the early Malcolm X? Mm -hmm. Those are different things. I can't know that for you. You have to decide that. So the second thing I'd like people to take away is the, the thought that culture work is hard work and it involves work on yourself mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. to interrogate the bases of your choices and your judgments mm -hmm. um and i think the third thing i'd say is just that uh there's room for interesting hard thought about black culture and black life even in what one might think of as fairly conservative institutional spaces like professional philosophy i've been making a lot of complaints about philosophy as a profession but i have had the opportunity to make a good living doing the thing that I that we are talking about. Mm -hmm. And that uh, is not nothing. And so there's space for people to think with other smart folks, other committed folks about what it means to live in a racialized landscape, live on a racialized landscape. Mm -hmm. um, and that itself is at least modestly encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Dr. Paul C. Teller, I just want to say thank you so much for being on Book Speaks and Beyond. Oh, it's my great pleasure. Thank you for the time. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Dr. Paul C. Teller about his book, Black is Beautiful, A Philosophy of Black Aesthetics. If you're interested in purchasing the book, you can go right inside the show notes and click on the link. It'll take you right to the storefront. And also, if you enjoyed any of the music that you've heard, there's also links in the show notes. And don't forget while you're in there to click on the iTunes link to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. And until next time, let's read, listen, explore.